Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, yesterday was quite a fun-filled first day of teach. Don't you agree? And I'm impressed that this hall is just about full because I know many of you stayed up late last night uh, dancing, uploading your lessons on Share My Lesson. Who made it all the way to midnight? Let me see your hands. And a lot of you are down front. That's impressive. <laughs> and let me do another poll. Raise your hand if you signed the pledge in the expo area to reclaim the promise for public education. Good, good. Uh, now, you should have received this toolkit. And we're sharing this with you, good, to take home and share the message with your friends and family. And as our passionate president said yesterday, none of us can be bystanders. We need to reach out to parents, community, civic leaders. We need to open their eyes, minds, and hearts. So if you haven't, and I think many of you haven't yet, if you haven't taken the pledge yet, and you haven't received the kit, please do so today. Check it out in the expo area. So yesterday was very exciting, and we've got a lot more in store for you today. So let's get started. It is my great pleasure to recognize the 2013 AFT Innovation Fund grantees. Now, I know it's hard to believe, but the Innovation Fund is celebrating its fifth anniversary this year, and we have over 30 impressive grantees. The fund supports creative ideas for improving schools from those who know them best, you, the educators. It is an annual grant competition and invests in the best and brightest ideas. AFT provides the grantees with resources and ideas and support to put their ideas into action. The fund is sponsored by grants from national philanthropies and also by AFT members, or dues. This is truly an example of solution-driven unionism at its best. And now, without further ado, the 2013 Innovation Fund grantees. First up, the Baltimore Teachers Union. <laughs> B2U will help teams of teachers at two schools create interdisciplinary, project-based lessons and these will be created for the students in those schools. Their partner is the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future. The National Commission brings in scientists, engineers, and other experts to assist the teachers in designing experiences that help students see how their academic work applies in the real world. Next, the Cincinnati Federation of Teachers. CFT is going to work with a select group of schools to use a new tool designed to guide planning and instruction aligned to the Common Core. They will be assisted by Student Achievement Partners, a great partner of AFT. It's a national organization working to make sure Common Core is implemented correctly. Over time, based on teachers' experiences with the tools, the project will inform discussions about evaluation so that evaluation is aligned with the standards. And the final two grants are also on Common Core. I think I sense a theme here. Uh, the Innovation Fund saw lots of interest from our members and we're delighted that we can support the work to continue to make sure that AFT members drive Common Core implementation so we get it right. So next, in Montana, the MEA MFT This is a merged state affiliate of the NEA and the AFT, and it is going to put professional development for teachers on the Common Core online. They will use the successful Montana Digital Academy, a publicly funded online academy taught by public school teachers as their model. This will make sure that teachers across the rural state, no matter how isolated, will have the knowledge they need to help students succeed. 
and in New York, the Poughkeepsie Public School Teachers Association. <laughs> Poughkeepsie is going to write and videotype model lessons and instructions for teaching Common Core lessons to English language learners at the high school level. It will be made nationally available on the Coloring Colorado website, where the Innovation Fund already has great material that was produced by our members in Albuquerque. So join me in saying congratulations to all of our 2013 Innovation Fund grantees. And I'd also like to congratulate the 2010 Innovation Fund grantees whose grants are wrapping up this fall. They are the United Federation of Teachers, Toledo Federation of Teachers, Hillsborough Classroom Teachers Association, Minneapolis Federation of Teachers, Boston Teachers Union, and Education Austin. So join me again in a round of applause. Across the AFT, there are so many inspiring examples of extraordinary work in progress. We want to be able to recognize our members' collective outstanding work, their collective wisdom, to create solutions that improve their workplaces and communities. That's why the AFT, in partnership with the Albert Shanker Institute and the Innovation Fund, has created the prize for solution-driven unionism. The $25,000 prize is to recognize the work that exemplifies our mission of providing high-quality public education, health care, and public services. So applications are online at AFT.org and will be accepted until August 16th. So get your applications in now. From working in coalitions with community organizations to devising solutions to improve the quality of services we deliver, from turning unfavorable conditions into opportunities for more positive outcomes to using new approaches to collective bargaining that aggressively and collaboratively move systemic reforms, we encourage you to share your examples of solution-driven unionism and apply for the prize. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage the woman who coined the phrase solution-driven unionism, our president, Randy Weingarten. Okay, I'm going to go off script for a second. Did everybody have fun last night? Because I know we work hard, and I know you really, really work hard at home. But every now and then, you need to have some fun. OK? So will you promise me you're going to have some fun? And I hear the heat wave is going to break just as we're leaving. <laughs> so I hope that you like this conversation today. The two people I am about to introduce are two of my favorite, favorite people, of the people that we work with all the time. And I hope it's going to be a really interesting conversation on advancing and on owning our profession. But before, I know you've seen this today. Somebody had a baby. <laughs> Do we know who it is, right? <laughs> Dr. Johnson just said our granddaughter. <laughs> but in that, in that um, USA Today, which now everyone in America and everyone in Great Britain and all of the Commonwealth that's still talking to Great Britain will be keeping. So in USA Today, which is, frankly, the newspaper that anyone in any hotel around pretty much now the world has. This was there.
So let me, as I'm losing all my cards here, let me thank Fran. Where is Fran? Where did she go? Stand up for a second. Let me thank Fran. Turn around to everybody else. Because what Fran did is Fran essentially did the predicate for what this conversation is about. She chaired our teacher preparation task force. And they have put a very significant and visible stake in the teacher prep territory. And I know that some of the members of the task force are here as well. And if they are, I just would like them to stand again with Fran and just say thank you very, very much to them. There are some of them. Thank you. It was a, it was a task force of K-12 and higher education. And people we represent both in K-12 and in higher education, all too often we don't have, or, and the outside world doesn't have higher ed and K-12 speaking to each other. And we thought it was really important to do that. So the task force report made some very substantive and groundbreaking recommendations. You know, the one that people heard about, I think, frankly, because of the riff on words, was the bar exam, or how to raise the bar. But frankly, that was the least of the recommendations in this report. The, the goal was how to elevate teacher preparation and the teaching profession. And what our, we were trying to aim at is how do we help new teachers so that all teachers are ready, are competent, and confident on their first official day of teaching. Now we know, and you know, we are a heck of a lot better at being school teachers our second and our third year than we are our first day. But this notion that you can just throw people the keys and abracadabra, we can do this work, is frankly very devaluing of our profession. So the goal of this task force was, how do we help people become confident and confident on their first official day of teaching, and how we can give our profession and our professionals the status and the support that they deserve? So the report had three recommendations. First was, all stakeholders, what a concept, have to be involved in improving teacher preparation, and that teacher preparation um, work has to be aligned around a well-grounded vision of effective teaching. That was number one. Number two, there should be a universal and rigorous entry assessment like the medical boards or a bar exam that doesn't just include what people know as praxis, but something that is some kind of written test that everybody these days has had to take, but also a full year of clinical experience. And what we had said is that we would hope, even though the, we know that teacher preparation and teacher certification does vary state to state, and we're not suggesting it should be federalized, but wouldn't it be good if, if you took it in one state, it would actually apply to all the other states. And three, we said that the primary responsibility for setting and enforcing professional standards and preparation program quality must reside with K-12 teachers and teacher educators. Again, can we stop, you know, look, business folks may be good at business. Educators need to actually have control of our profession. So that's why I said when I started that our guest today couldn't be better equipped to discuss this topic. And they are people that you know well and people who have been 
a friend of our profession and a friend of teaching and learning and of teachers and what we do for as many years as I have known both these wonderful people. So first, I would like to welcome my friend and our friend, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. As she comes up, Linda is the Charles E. Dunkman, Dunkman, right? Close enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor of Education at Stanford's Graduate School of Education, where she launched the School Redesign Network and the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education. Linda was the founding executive director of the National Commission on Teaching, um, on Teaching and America's Future, and is the author of more than a dozen books on education policy and practice. And after this session, during the lunch break, Linda will be signing her latest book, Getting Teacher Evaluation Right, right outside the expo area, a book that she started doing as we were doing some of this original work a couple of years ago with the Albert Schenker Institute. Let's give a great hand to Linda darling -Hammond. Our other guest is Ron Thorpe. Come on out, Ron, as I introduce you. Now, a lot of the New Yorkers and the New Jerseyans, did I say that right? <laughs> Those people from New Jersey. <laughs> not including your current governor, who is not invited. <laughs> but a lot of folks from New York and New Jersey know Ron because Ron really was the genius behind that kind of uh, expo in March for teaching and learning that Channel 13 did. He said while he was at Channel 13 that it was really, really important for teachers to be honored in some real way in a professional circumstance. And so it was just amazing to all of us in the public education world when Ron said, I'm leaving Channel 13 to actually become the president and the CEO of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. A board, by the way, that, what, that came out of a concept that Al Shanker and Mary Futrell had years ago about how we actually elevate the practice of teaching. So Ron is bringing the National Board into exciting new directions in the less than two years that he has been at the helm. His, as I told you, his impressive career included being Vice President for Education at WNET in New York, which is the nation, still the nation's flagship public television station, and he was, early in his career, an assistant to the legendary education knoll, just mentor of all of ours, Ted Sizer. So I just want to once again say thank you, Ron, for taking that job <laughs> and for being here and always being out there for teachers in public education. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> now, now I get to do an interview with these two wonderful folks. And I'm going to start with Linda. And we're going to start about teacher preparation. So, Linda. Just what do we really know about the nature of the experience that gets a student ready to be a teacher? What are, in your judgment, um, and based upon all the research that you've done, what are the key elements of pre-service preparation that can ready students and new teachers for the very real challenges that they will face entering our profession and entering their classrooms? Well, I'll, I'll start by just saying I've been worrying about this question for 30-some years since I came into teaching myself um, in uh, a program 
an intern program in Pennsylvania. I did my student teaching in Camden, New Jersey, um, in a classroom where the teacher said, I'm so glad you're here, handed me the key and left. So I knew what not to do, but uh, trying to figure out what to do in teacher education has been a long haul. Clearly, the most important thing is that the fundamentals of practice, knowing about how kids learn, knowing about the content and how to teach it so that people can understand it, um, understanding how to build a curriculum across uh, a period of time, not just going lesson by lesson, has to be connected to practice. And that's the key. Um, you know, we have to have teachers engaged with expert teachers in schools, preferably in schools that are designed and organized to support learning to teach the whole time that you're taking courses. Right. You can't do this kind of, you know, study a bunch of theory for four years and then take eight weeks of student teaching on the end and hope that you remember all the stuff you learned in theory that you weren't practicing uh, and then go into a classroom where you don't see those same things emulated. So great programs connect expert teachers who are engaged in productive practice. Um, increasingly, those are national board certified teachers um, who are cooperating teachers with a curriculum that understands that it's knowing the learner and knowing the content and bringing those things together. Uh, and I will say that one aspect of this that's becoming very exciting uh, these days is the residency model that a lot of your districts um, have begun to develop, Boston, Denver, um, San Francisco, uh, where Stanford and uh, the uh, United Educators of San Francisco and the district, is Dennis here? There he there is. is. <laughs> Dennis, stand up. Um, my partner in crime. <laughs> What we're doing there is taking this idea to yet the next level, which is that urban teaching is particularly challenging. Right. You need to understand a lot of things about the context that children experience. Kids are coming from different language backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, et cetera. So you add that to all the other aspects of learning to teach. You want to learn that from the very best urban teachers who know something that very few people know in this world. And then you want to connect teacher education that we've created a residency program there as others have where you get a full year of practice like that in a school designed to help you learn with the best teachers the coursework connected to it and then two years of mentoring beyond that experience and you bring people in rather than throwing them into shortage fields and hoping they sink or swim you bring them in and make them expert from the very first days on the job and that's I think the vision that we need to hold, which is a collaborative vision between unions, districts, schools of education for building the profession. Now what's interesting, before I go to Ron, what's interesting is that in the medical model, people get this. And there is a residency that is baked in to the medical model before, separate and apart from any paper and pencil tests, separate and apart from any, you know, computer generated tests, it's just baked in um, before anyone can actually practice medicine. Um, and so, what do you think, um, I mean, how, how do you think we can actually um, push at this? Because it does feel like that residency model really reaps, it really has huge, huge, huge um, benefits. And so do we push at it through, um, just like in medicine, Medicaid actually pays for residencies? And do we push for some kind of federal um, uh, monetary intervention here? Do we push for it in terms of state um, funding? I mean, how do we actually push to make sure that even though it has to be done at a local level, um, that, that school districts have the funding yeah. to actually be able to do that. So could I just say, um, this was actually something Obama campaigned on in 2008. We're still waiting for this part of the agenda to uh, come online. Uh, he said, if you teach, we will pay for your education, number one. Like in Finland. Like in Finland, like in Singapore, free ride. If you're going to teach, it's to our benefit as a nation to pay for your education. And by the way, usually that comes with an expectation that you'll stay in the profession for at least four years so that you don't get the churn, right? <laughs> Number two, uh, 
residency models were on the table. He wrote that legislation. I helped a little with it. Um, and uh, were funded in the early years of the administration. We need to reclaim that and have that residency funding flowing uh, to districts once again. Uh, number three, the federal government in medicine uh, does pay for teaching hospitals through the, um, uh, sit, you know, through the uh, third party payer and, right. and other financial aid system. We should have the federal government paying for teaching hospitals and education, professional development schools where this kind of work can go on. Good. So if there is actually really a real reauthorized ESEA, it feels like this should be a part of that. Absolutely. Okay, Ron, in the Raising the Bar um, task force that the AFT did on, um, on uh, teacher preparation, we talked a lot, as I had um, told folks right now, about how educators in K-12 and higher ed should be owning our profession. The word professional is in the very title of the national board. So how far are we away from this notion that we are or should be professionals? How far away, not from the rhetoric of it, but from the actual practice of it? And what are you trying to do? Because I want people to really hear the kind of ingenuity and creativity that Ron is bringing to, um, to um, the National Board. What are you doing to actually promote and push this? So before I get to that, I do want to say something about Randy Weingarten. When we created the Celebration of Teaching and Learning, which I still think is the best conference we've ever created for educators in this country, Randy was the first person I went to talk to. And we had this grand idea at WNET that we were going to do this big event for teachers, and it was going to be in September. And she said, no. If you really care, Ron Thorpe, about teachers, you will not do this in September. <laughs> this is not when teachers need a big conference. I said, oh, w when do we do it? She said, March. She said, March is the lowest morale month. If you are serious, you will do this in March. And I just saluted and put it in March. <laughs> you know that's true. That's true. And so in your, in your books here for this conference, you'll see a whole page. We're going to bring our new version of the celebration back next March here in Washington at the Convention Center, March 14th and 15th. Keep your eye on that page and uh, see what happens. It should be good. So when Al Shanker and the people uh, who were around at the time of A Nation Prepared were thinking hard about how we were going to get beyond a nation of risk, they came up with this idea of a National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. And what they did at the time, and Linda was involved, Lee Shulman was involved, all, all the iconic names were involved with it. What they had in mind was taking a page out of medicine, primarily, but the other professions as well. All of those professions have been built in large part around a concept of a National Board of professional standards. These are standards of accomplished practice. These are not entry-level standards, and nor was the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards or any of them ever supposed to be the mensa of education. It's accomplished teaching. Professions define themselves by accomplished practice. By definition, you can't be accomplished, as Randy said in her opening remarks, in your first year. You, you can't do it. No one is accomplished in the first year probably not even the second year, it takes time. As Randy said in her remarks yesterday, why are we the only profession where experience doesn't seem to count? You have to practice. That's what all these professions talk about. They're practitioners. They have to practice to get it right. So the National Board was brought together, and believe me, it was called by many people at the time mission impossible. No one really thought that three point whatever million teachers who mostly are women and mostly come out of the middle class in our country could become a true profession. 
But the National Board soldiered on with Jim Hunt, Governor Jim Hunt is our, our board chair, and Jim Kelly is the founding uh, president and CEO. They had 63 people around the table at the board meetings. Linda was there. And uh, Al Shanker was there. Mary Kuchar was there. It was the profession wrestling with what it would take to identify standards of accomplished practice. And over the years, they did that. And over the years, they created a certification process that's pretty reliable, that lets people know when you have met those standards. What the National Board and, and teachers who've created the National Board, they, that, those are huge successes. What we haven't succeeded at, and this is what we must do, we must take this to scale. In medicine today, 90% of physicians are board certified. They do it, as Randy said, the minute they leave their residency program. And by the way, every, every physician in America today spends three to seven years in a residency program before they can say they're an autonomous practitioner. And the minute they leave the residency program, they sit for the boards. And then, as I've heard my dear colleague Linda say on many occasions, when, when the physicians sit for the boards, 98% pass. And no one thinks that's because it's low standards, and no one thinks it's because they're geniuses. They pass because the trajectory that started in day one in medical school has been exquisitely engineered to lead to that spot. And that's where we have failed as practitioners. In our profession, we have not done that. And so when, national, when people sit for the boards today, uh, only 40% of, of candidates for the boards pass the boards on their first try. And after three tries, only 70% of that initial cohort passed the boards. That's not the teacher's fault. That's because we haven't got this trajectory right. And working with Linda right now and, and the AFT report, that's what the AFT report is all about, getting that trajectory right. So it's, you know what, I'm, it's, an inter it's interesting. I mean, I've had many private conversations and sat on many panels with both Linda and Ron, but what's interesting is that there is a model in other professions that we can follow, and instead, and Linda knows where I'm going with this, we've chose to do accountability, not we in this room, but the powers that be have chosen to do accountability by something called a value add process. Um, and we know, and, and, and they've chosen not in this country, and Linda says this, you know, before some of us actually ever knew to go to Finland or Singapore, Linda actually pointed that out in her writing. But they, but in Singapore and in Finland, they have actually taken the dollars to invest in preparation which is what we do, as Ron just said, in the medical model. In America, in the last few years, the policy has been to invest the dollar in evaluation, not in preparation. And so I'm just going to ask Linda, and I hope she doesn't laugh at me for doing this. <laughs> so we know value add doesn't make sense. And we know grading teacher preparation programs mostly through the lens of standardized test scores of their graduate students also doesn't make sense. But could you help us understand in English, not just in our core reaction to it, why do that doesn't make sense? And what alternatives do we offer instead so that we actually can be the advocates that we know we ought to be when these things come up in public sessions or in our district you know, boards or things like that. Um, thank you. Um, this is one that I you know, have worked hard on. And uh, I have to say, when the idea of value-added evaluation came out, I was one of many people who said, hey, this sounds kind of like, um, you know, it ought to work. 
be, we ought to think that, you know, you could look at teachers, you know, and their kids' gains and, and make something of it. Uh, it. Conceptually, it makes sense to people. That's why it's hard to have this conversation with a lot of people. But then studies started to come out. And what we found, and I was among the people doing studies early on, was that this value-added metric that comes about uh, is really the, the error term in the regression equation. Don't glaze over, stay with me. <laughs> it's, they say we're going to predict what we think should matter for achievement, student demographics and things like that. Whatever's left over, we're calling it the teacher effect. But in that little basket is the principal effect, there's the resource effect, there's the curriculum, there's all the other teachers, there are the tutors after school, there's the parents, there's the healthcare. All of that is in this leftover piece. We call it the teacher effect. Uh, but the teacher is actually only a p small part of that. In addition, so it turns out that these values are very unstable. Uh, a teacher who is get, given an A grade one year because they're in the top 20% has a 50% chance of getting a C, D, or F the next year. A teacher who gets an F grade one year because they're in the bottom 20% has a 50% chance of getting an A, B, or C the next year. We, we've seen this in study after study. What determines that flip-flopping, it turns out, even when you do the statistical controls for students, classroom composition, who's in your class, actually has a lot to do with when the uh, flip-flopping occurs. And I'm almost done. This is exacerbated by the test rules under No Child Left Behind, which say that you can only measure grade level standards in your tests. Which means that if you're teaching a ninth grade class, you know darn well that half your kids are, or at least a third of them, are, are scoring somewhere, you know, are, their skill level is somewhere between kindergarten and seventh grade. And another third of them have skill levels above the ninth grade level. They're not getting measured at all in terms of their gains on the test because the test is only measuring the grade level. So it turns out that value added test scores as a measure of teacher effectiveness don't work. They're highly inaccurate. And it's not professional. So it's not professional to take an inaccurate measure and right. then use that as the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. However, the idea that we should care about student learning is one that we need to bring into evaluation. And that can be done in a lot of ways. Teachers can assemble evidence of what their students have learned that's mapped to their kids and their curriculum in their classroom that can be part of a portfolio of evidence for teacher evaluation. The National Board was the first place that that idea was put into action. Uh, and in fact, how many people here are National Board certified? We must have some folks in the room. All right. So you know that you know, you're assembling evidence of student learning. Now, that can be part of the teacher evaluation portfolio along with standards-based evaluations of practice by skilled evaluators who know what they're looking at and use good standards. For schools of education, we need a similar kind of evidence. Uh, we, in California, started something called the Teacher Performance Assessment for licensure. The legislature passed that in 1998. We now have every school of education uh, has to choose one of three performance assessments. My uh, institution helped to create something called the PACT, the Performance Assessment for California Teachers. It's like a baby national board portfolio. Uh, it, you plan a curriculum, you adapt it for English learners and students with special needs, you teach it for a week, you videotape yourself teaching that, you collect evidence of student learning, you analyze that evidence, and it is scored in a portfolio reliably by trained evaluators who are cooperating teachers in the schools. They are professors and supervisors in the universities. We have a high reliability in scoring. And it predicts later effectiveness exactly. when you do the research on large numbers of teachers. Um, that kind of thing is, I think, part of the bar exactly. that we talk about. And when you get that feedback in teacher evaluation, in teacher education, you can see how many of your candidates can actually teach. And guess what? When you get evidence about whether your candidates can actually teach, it makes you go, oh my, we didn't teach them how to assess students. Or, gee, we need to do more. 
about preparing them for English learners. So it has caused this reform. Number, so that would be one piece of evidence. We should also survey our graduates, as many places do, but now in California we're gonna do it for the whole state. Every graduate will have an opportunity to say what they had the opportunity to learn in their teacher education program uh, when they go for their license and again when they go to renew their license in a couple of years and they can comment on the induction that they also received. And we'll be able to say which of the programs are viewed by their graduates and by the employers as actually having done the job that they were supposed to do and which ones did not. And then we can hone in on those places where the evidence from performance assessments and surveys tells us that there's a problem and we can strengthen accreditation so that those who are not investing adequately either do so or get out of the market. Because we cannot afford to have schools of education that are not doing the job that they need to do to prepare teachers to have the tools that they need. So you see, and then I'm gonna um, ask Ron a similarly, I hope, interesting question. But you see that the, the, the reason we know so much now about why value add doesn't work is because we've tried it and seen it. But we also know what does work, and starting to learn what does work about how we assess student learning. And part of what the Common Core may do is help push, as we heard from this panel or the panel yesterday, things like project-based learning, portfolio assessments, authentic assessments, and things like that about how we push to see real proxies of student learning. And then also, as Linda just said, real surveying of both employers as well as the folks who came out of teacher preparation programs about what they thought they got and didn't get and then use that data. So data is important, but it has to be the right data not simply some regression analysis that ends up in a numeric score that no one can either explain or understand how anybody arrived at. And so I wanna just um, toss the last question out to Ron, which is, you know, initially when the, when the board um, got its legs, a lot of people talked about national board certification and about how important it was and things like that. And then there was a fall off. Um, but when you talk, when Ron talks, Ron will talk about how national board is a key ingredient to actually having a continuum in our profession. So in our profession, it doesn't simply have to be you are a paraprofessional, or you are a teacher, or you are a principal. Loretta Johnson has done so much, as have many others in this room, about creating career ladders between paras or paraprofessionals becoming teachers. What the National Board does is it creates a whole bunch of ways where teachers can have various different avenues to other roles in teaching and learning. And so I just want you to talk a little bit about that, Ron, because I think that people, that it's gotten lost a bit, particularly in, and I'm not being political here, particularly in kind of the TFA push of just having people being teachers for a couple of years and then taking other leadership jobs outside of teaching. There is a real kind of career path that you and others have talked about using the National Board. Right, so let me go back to this point. The National Board over the years somehow, and we generated this, it was our, we made our problem, the problem for ourselves, that board certified teachers were the elite, and we were the, the special group at, at, at one end of the spectrum. And that's never what it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be about accomplished practice. That's what defines a profession. So that wherever you send your child to school across the country, you can be pretty well satisfied that that person in the classroom 
has, has the skills that, you, that they need to help your child. So the National Board Standards, which were created by people, probably people in this room, many of you have probably served on the Standards Committees, the Certification Council, because it is of the profession and by the profession. So over the years, over 25 years, teachers like you have created these standards. But we haven't embedded those standards in the continuum, starting with teacher preparation. But one of the things that we're doing in, in uh, collaboration with the folks at Stanford and Linda's team is we're taking the videos of board certified teachers, those who successfully certified, and the reflective papers. They will be put into a, a searchable electronic database and we will make that database available in teacher preparation programs. Now, what does this do? This puts in the minds of people in day one of preparation what accomplished teaching looks like and how accomplished teachers think. And that thinking part is really important and you need to help us insist on that. Videos alone will not change our profession. And if you need proof of that, just remember that everyone in America has watched teachers for 15,000 hours as students. <laughs> and that gives us the sense that anybody can be a teacher. Believe me, if, if by the time you were 19 years old, you had watched a doctor for 15,000 hours, you'd say, I can do that. <laughs> but what you can't do is get inside their heads. The reflective papers are critical to this. So here you are, uh, you're a sophomore in your university, you've declared you're pre-teaching, pre you wanna go in a career in teaching, and what your professors are immersing you in are images of, of accomplished teaching and the analytical process that's part of being a, an accomplished teacher. I think that's a game changer. None of us in, our, in this room had that experience as undergraduates. All we had in our head, by and large, was the image of one or two teachers back in our own school. I'll do my own. I was a Latin teacher when I started my career. I had one Latin teacher, Carolyn Nolan. I loved her. My mother had one Latin teacher. Her name was Carolyn Nolan. <laughs> she loved her too. I, I delivered Miss Nolan's paper. She was the organist in our church. You know, I, she was terrific. But how did I know whether Ms. Nolan was a really good Latin teacher or not? I only had one. So where do I go to get other models? Now, shift over to something you could all recognize. I'll use a baseball metaphor. Every little leaguer in America is eight or nine or 10 years old, and they can only do what eight or nine or 10 year olds can do. But if that child is playing shortstop, he's got Derek Jeter in his head, right? And so the coach has a real advantage helping this, this boy get better because he already has a sense of what the best shortstop in professional baseball looks like. And he's trying to emulate that all the time. That's what we need to help introduce into the teaching continuum from pre-service to accomplished. And once we have that as the norm in education, then we need to find ways to, to deploy accomplished teachers in other parts of the school curriculum. Let me give a quick example. I had a chance recently to meet with five board certified teachers who were Einstein fellows this year. When I met, I thought I was in the presence of royalty. These people were incredible. Then the tragic moment happened at the end of the conversation. Not a single one was looking forward to going back into the classroom. And the reason is they had been here in Washington at the NSF where they were treated like adults. They were asked their opinions, they were asked to help create policy, and they knew that when they were going back to their schools, that wasn't gonna matter anymore. We, that, that's not a profession. You can't take the best teachers, you can't take your Einstein fellows and have them leave. So that's what we need to pull for. And I think as educators, we need to stand up for the standards that we created the profession standards of accomplished practice. Fantastic. I'm looking to see. So, Chris tells me I have to wrap up, but I'm gonna ask one more question. <laughs> um, which is that um, 
There's so much in this conversation that's so rich, and we just touched the surface, although we did talk about how data, how you can actually use data in a different way and how it can be our friend, not our frenemy or not our enemy. We've talked a lot about um, how you can really think about the National Board differently, um, and hopefully it will spark some interest in it and using those roles in a different way in our schools. And we talked a lot about things like residencies and ways of, you know, of, of really having the support that new teachers need. So we've talked about a bunch of these things. But let me just say, you got some amazing educators in this room and advocates in this room. One last word from both of you in terms of what you want to say on anything to this amazing group of professionals. So, so let me start, because I defer to the professor to the, for the final word here. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have, and I can say this from my own personal experience, because I am not a board certified teacher, as my colleagues out there say, you're a muggle, Ron. You're not ever going to <laughs> do this. I think the hardest thing for us as experienced adults is to understand that the next generation coming along needs more than we had. And we need to be able to say that without feeling self-conscious that that lessens us. So I may not be board certified, but I want the next generation to be that way. And over time, that will build the profession. That's what's happened in medicine. That's what's happened in architecture and engineering, all of them. But those of us who are sort of beyond the place, and we were raised in a different generation, we have to have the courage to say, we didn't have that opportunity, but my young colleagues are going to have it. And that's what I'd urge you to help us with. I guess I'll uh, pick up on the thread about how important it is for us to understand uh, what great teachers do when they think about and en engage in their practice. And the key for all of us is to figure out ways to share your expertise and to enable others to share their expertise, not only with those coming into the profession, but with those who are struggling in their first years in the profession and with our colleagues in the schools. We live in schools um, today that were invented in the uh, scientific management era of the early 1900s, the warehouse factory model schools, in which the idea was that there was no role for teacher collaboration, in which the idea was that you could program what teachers were to do and they were on the assembly line and they would just implement the rules and the regulations. And that whole bureaucratic accountability structure still governs a lot of policy and practice. Uh, and what I see the AFT doing today is setting sights on a new way of reconceptualizing schools and the profession. Uh, that is rested in professional accountability, not bureaucratic accountability, that calls on all of the members of the profession to develop and share their expertise in a lot of different ways. Uh, and I think that's the key idea, uh, to develop, share, collaborate uh, around the um, goal of the profession to educate all kids well, to reach out to families, to be a part of communities. Uh, and that extends from beginning of preparation uh, all the way through the development of accomplished practice. Thank you. You see why we love these two? So I want to thank Linda and Ron. And before we leave for lunch, I want to just tell you something we are releasing today. Now, there's not a local union I've been to, there's not a person in this room who I have spoken to who hasn't talked to me about the fixation and obsession with standardized testing. And at our convention last year, and at our executive council last year after the convention, we tried, our, at our convention people said, 
try to figure out what to do about this other than simply advocate that we shouldn't be obsessed with standardized testing, we should be obsessed with learning. So our staff did something really wonderful. They used their research ability and had it reviewed by outside experts. And today, we are releasing a study that examines the costs of testing in two medium-sized urban school districts. As I said, it's one thing to talk anecdotally about it, but even when you do a really conservative study, no one can say we actually went and did high numbers. We were as conservative as we could be. The numbers are pretty incredible. So in one school district, which we call the Midwestern District, because we did not want to release the names of these districts for the obvious reasons. Too many people do blame and shame. Let's actually try to use the data instead of trying to blame and shame. So in the Midwestern District, test prep and actual teaching time, I'm not talking about all the other time that you can't account for when you see the actual schedules in schools, the actual pacing schedules, the actual schedules. Test prep and actual teaching testing time in the most heavily tested grades took up 19 full days out of the school year. And in the Eastern School District, test prep and testing time used up to a month and a half. Now, no one is saying we abandon testing altogether, but give you a sense of this. The Midwestern School District could add between 20 to 40 minutes of instruction to the school day for most grades, even if they just mitigated some of that testing. And the Eastern District could add up to an entire class period each day in grades 6 through 11. So that's what it would actually equate to using the math. So think about just cutting it in half, what you could use that money for. And so what we did was we just did the mathematics taking the, the schedules, doing the math, and seeing what it is co costing and what it is squeezing out. The two school districts are illustrative examples, but they could be thousands across the country. And you know, as well as I do, that the current test and punish accountability system has squeezed out vital parts of the curriculum that are not subjected to testing, and that, as we said yesterday, as the poll of parents said that we released yesterday as well, we have to stop America's political leaders' obsession with testing and think about what we can use that funding for. The results are online at AFT.org. Take a look at it. It is pretty eye-popping. And thank you, everyone, for this session.